a very good morning everyone this is dr singaram in this today's sh short session i am going to discuss about congenital zika syndrome which is a topic of recent interest because of the number of cases reported in india we all know that the zika virus is a flavi virus which is specifically a neurotropic flavi virus neurotropic flavi virus it was first described in uganda in 1947 in zika virus so that is why it gets the name as zika virus uh, we all know that it's a vector borne disease and the vector for this particular uh, condition is a well known aedes aegypti mosquito which we know is a mosquito associated with the transmission of other infectious diseases like dengue fever chikungunya and yellow fever now talking about this zika virus transmission the main mode is a vector borne transmission we all know this but however there are also non vector borne transmission also possible for this particular virus which you should be aware of and these include sexual transmission especially uh, from the partners who are returning from an endemic area they are likely to transmit uh, the infection that is a sexual route the other way is by materno fetal transmission that is from the mother to the baby during pregnancy or intrauterine transmission it is also possible that it can be transmitted through blood transmission these are the non vector borne routes uh, going forward for this particular discussion the main discussion will be about the materno fetal transmission or the congenital infection what we called as congenital zika syndrome just like any other intrauterine infection congenital zika syndrome is also commonly transmitted during the first trimester you can see the percentage of uh, incidence of uh, percentage of transmission in the first trimester only it is high uh, 8 to 15 percentage whereas it is relatively lesser in the other trimester now here is a very very important point to be noted that uh, even if the mother is asymptomatic there is chance of transmission from the mother to the fetus that is the point to be noted generally remember zika virus infection is usually asymptomatic if at all it causes symptom it generally causes just like any other mild viral illness like fever rash something like uh, a conjunctivitis can be associated however please remember whether it's a symptomatic or an asymptomatic mother there is always a chance of transmission during pregnancy that is the point to be noted now next thing to be noted is regarding the features of congenital zika virus syndrome please remember it's a neurotropic virus i told you so most of the features would be related to the neurological system starting with manifestations in the skull please remember in this particular condition the skull as you can see from the picture given it is a partially collapsed skull it is a partially collapsed skull and along with that there are some brain abnormalities also which contributes to microcephaly which contributes to microcephaly okay right second important point to be noted is in this particular condition uh, there is overlap of sutures there is overlapping of the sutures of the skull and one more important point is there is a prominent occiput there is prominent occiput these are the prominent findings in the skull which you should know to be associated with congenital zika syndrome other neurological impairment would include i told you there is microcephaly as a part of it there is low iq as well as increased incidence of seizures in this particular condition okay right now the next point to be noted is this condition causes thinning of the cerebral cortex thinning of the cerebral cortex okay and especially what is going to be affected it is going to affect the white matter it is going to affect the white matter commonly and very very characteristic feature of this particular condition which you should always know and a possible mcq for it exams is subcortical calcifications very very important point it is subcortical calcification now at this point you should also remember what are the other intrauterine infections which can be associated with calcification in the brain yes there are two other things also one is cytomegalovirus which is associated with periventricular calcification and one more is toxoplasmosis which is associated with diffuse parenchymal calcification so whenever you study about intrauterine infection and calcification in the brain all these condition should be remembered okay right now other manifestation would include hearing impairment of course i am talking about sensorineural 
hearing loss as a manifestation. Okay. Now, one more very very important thing which you should all remember for your exams is this condition is associated with abnormalities in the tone and it is commonly associated with hypertonia. Very very important point. Some cases you do encounter hypotonia as well but the characteristic feature they say in tone abnormality is hypertonia only and that too it is more of spasticity. It is more of spasticity. Okay. And last neurological impairment which you should be aware of is that these children have increased incidence of extrapyramidal manifestation. That is extrapyramidal manifestation includes the well known chorea and the athetosis. These are the neurological impairments encountered in Zika virus, congenital Zika virus syndrome. Moving on, what are the other associated abnormalities which one can encounter here? That is something related to what is I have shown in this particular picture. What is that? You can see that this child's limbs are affected. Can you see that the limbs are abnormally positioned? This is due to increased incidence of contractures noted in this particular condition. It is due to contractures noted in this particular condition. It commonly manifests as a unilateral or a bilateral club foot. Bilateral club foot. It can also be associated with multiple deformities due to contractures all over the body and this condition is called as arthrogryposis, arthrogryposis multiplex congenita, arthrogryposis multiplex congenita. That is a point to be noted, right? This is again an important finding which you should know as associated with congenital Zika virus syndrome, okay? Right. So we have studied about neurological impairment as well as the um, skeletal involvement, okay, musculoskeletal involvement. The next one to be noted is regarding the eye findings, very very important. As you can see in this picture, okay, retina can be affected in this particular condition. The prominent manifestations of this particular condition would include some scars noted in the macula, okay, macular scarring, number one. Number two is that the retina will show some pigmentary changes, okay. Retina will show some pigmentary changes, what we call it as pigmentary mottling, okay, pigmentary mottling. As you can see from the picture itself, there is some pigmentary mottling which is noted, right. Other than this, it can be associated with atrophy of the chorea and the choroid and the retina. Atrophy of the retina and the choroid can be noted and it can also cause structural abnormalities like coloboma, cataract. And because of all these manifestations, the eye as such appears to be small in size, what we call it as microphthalmia. Okay. These are the prominent manifestations in the eye region. So remember, this is a condition which can affect um, the brain, which can affect the eye, which can affect the hearing, as well as causing contractures. So the five cardinal features of congenital Zika virus syndrome, which I have already told you, just quickly revising through are severe microcephaly with a partially collapsed skull, thin cerebral context, don't forget the characteristic subcortical calcification. One more is contractures which can manifest as arthrogryposis multiplex congenita. Then the eye findings would include macular scarring and pigmentary retinal modeling. One should also not forget about hypertonia and extrapyramidal features. Right. So these are the features of congenital Zika syndrome which you should know about. Next is regarding how to make a diagnosis. Please remember the usual specimens which are used for diagnosis of congenital Zika syndrome are one is blood, the other one is the urine samples. Okay, from the blood and the urine samples, we are going to do the testing for this infection. Okay, and the investigation of choice happens to be RRT PCR. What is this RRT PCR? It is a real time reverse transcriptase PCR. That is what is expansion for RRT PCR. This is supposed to be the chest of choice in diagnosing congenital Zika virus syndrome. Okay. We can also do a serology to test for IgM antibodies using ELISA, IgM antibodies using ELISA testing. But here is an important point. Once IgM antibody turns out to be positive, we need to confirm that it is specific only for Zika virus. And that specificity of IgM antibodies is by a test called as PRNT. It is plaque reduction neutralization testing. P N P R N T. Okay. Plaque reduction neutralization testing. This is supposed to confirm 
the specificity of IgM antibodies against Zika virus. Okay, right. Now, I have told you before that blood and urine are the preferred samples. But please remember, if you want to get high yield from these uh, testing, the samples have to be collected in the first two days after birth itself. Within the first two days after birth, you should collect the sample to test for this particular infection. This is also an important point to be noted. Okay, right. Now, is there any treatment for congenital Zika syndrome? There is no treatment, obviously. Uh, how can we prevent then the congenital Zika virus syndrome? We have to prevent the mothers from getting the infection during pregnancy. Okay, right. There is no, unfortunately, there is no vaccine available for congenital Zika virus syndrome. So, the only mode of uh, prevention is avoiding exposure after visiting an endemic area. Okay, right. And how long should the pregnancy be avoided? It depends on uh, which partner has traveled to that endemic area or which partner is having the infection. For example, if it is a female partner who had traveled to an endemic area or is having the infection, okay, they have to avoid pregnancy for the next two months. This next two months is after returning from the endemic area or after the onset of symptoms in case the patient is symptomatic, right. So, two months in case of female partners. If it is a male partner, it is changed to 3 months, okay. Or both male and female are affected or both the partners are affected or both of them have visited the endemic area, then also pregnancy should be avoided for the next 3 months, okay, right. Now, there can be a doubt as to why in males alone 3 months and female it is only 2 months. This is because in males, the Zika virus tends to remain in the seminal fluids or in the semen for a longer period of time, okay. So, that is why in males a longer period of 3 months is advised, okay, right. So, this is the only way by which uh, prevention of Zika virus syndrome can be done, unfortunately because there is no vaccine available till date, okay. So, that ends the discussion of congenital Zika syndrome. Uh, please do uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you like the video, uh, please share it with your friends and if you have any queries, please put it up in the comment section. I will be happy to reply. I will see you soon in the next video. Thank you.